Hello and welcome to this recording of the Optimising Outcomes workshop that Cathy and I presented at AOPA in 2017. In this recording, I will be covering the first half of the workshop, which will look at subacial socket design, unity elevated vacuum, as well as casting methods, and then also training considerations as well. I'll also be providing an update on the Proflex family of products. We will then be doing a second recording that will cover Rio Knee updates including the new functions of the RIO, how to program it, and training considerations. And we'll also be providing a mechanical knee overview also. So I'm going to go straight into discussing Unity. Um, there are some specific advantages to using elevated vacuum suspension, of which I'll run through in the next few slides. One of the benefits of elevated vacuum is that it provides a very firm suspension, which provides excellent security and improved proprioception for users. There is also evidence that elevated vacuum tends to assist in maintaining a more constant limb volume, and therefore it actually helps to decrease the need to add any additional socks throughout the day. And there's also evidence that it assists in wound healing because it helps to draw fluid back into the limb, improving circulation through the residual limb, and thereby promoting wound healing. It can also provide good distal comfort to bony and sensitive distal ends, as long as the socket fits properly and there's a good volume and length matching. Now, normally there's a volume loss of 4 to 10 percent during the day, and 90 percent of this loss happens within the first two hours of the day. A study by Bordetel has found that this can lead to a poor socket fit and cystening, and in turn, this means that the user will get a loss of proprioception and a feeling of insecurity in gait. The activity specific balance confidence scale was significantly increased when using elevated vacuum, and you can therefore argue that you are helping to improve the safety of the user as this indicates a lower predictive instance of future falls. The study also reports an increase in improved functional outcomes with a reduction in skin problems such as blistering and skin breakdown, and also increase in the user's walking time, indicating that active vacuum has the potential to actually increase someone's mobility. And here's some further evidence relating to active vacuum providing volume control. The findings in these studies show that vacuum assisted sockets have been shown to eliminate daily volume loss, as well as providing a more symmetrical gait, being observed due to the reduction in pissing and maintaining limb volume. Sanders found that when the limb volume decreases, the socket will become loose, and this often causes pressure to bony prominences, which may result in pain and or injury. Um, and using active vacuum has been shown to eliminate some of these problems. This evidence indicates that active vacuum is something that we should be considering as a necessity for users, as opposed to just a nice to have. So this is just a summary of all the primary benefits of the Unity system. It is a sleeveless system, which helps to increase knee flexion range, and it also ties in with the increased reliability, as we are minimizing the risk of leaks in the system from sleeve punctures. It only adds around 130 grams to the weight of the limb, and it's actually housed within the foot shell, so there's no additional bulk or build height. It doesn't depend on a shot mechanism, um, and therefore it's quite discreet. It's very simple and efficient as well. Um, it's quick and easy to elevate and release the vacuum levels. It just utilizes the deflection of the foot to draw vacuum. And the pumps are retrofitable on the new Proflex range, including the new Proflex XC torsion that we've just released. And in terms of who this is suitable for, it can be used for transtibial and transfemoral users from low to high impact levels. The weight limit is determined by the specific foot modules. Um, An elevated vacuum requires a total contact socket, so any gaps or pockets in the socket will actually cause major issues with blood and fluid being poured into the gaps. So if you can't maintain contact distally between the liner and the limb, then it's not a recommended solution. And if you're expecting big volume changes, so for interims, for instance, it's not really ideal until they become more stable. Otherwise, you'll be changing the socket a lot quicker than you would ideally like to be. The Unity system consists of a pump mechanism, which utilizes the movement of the foot in order to draw air from the socket. In this example, upon heel deflection, the frame moves up and the support blade moves down, thereby expanding the membrane housed within the pump. When air is efficiently drawn out the socket, there are check valves that ensure that air do not flow back into the socket. 
And the heel pad acts as secure support for the unity upper blade. And when the membrane deflects, air is efficiently drawn out of the socket. The feet on the screen here show all the options you can have for unity compatible otter feet. It includes low active balance solutions, dynamic and impact feet, including the newly added ProFlex XC torsion and ProFlex LP torsion. It's only the Talix foot and the sport solutions where unity is currently not an option. For the traps general unity application, you'll need to assess the user's needs activity level and impact level in order to choose the suitable knee system. We now have a full range of knee solutions from K1 to K4. And the K1 to K3 knees are highlighted here, um, which range from knees with weight activated braking mechanisms, polycentric full bar knees, and pneumatic cylinders capable of varying walking speeds. For higher level K3, K4 users, there is the option of the PASO, which features an auto-adaptive pneumatic cylinder capable of walking speeds of around seven kilometers an hour and more. Um, the Rio Knee 3 has just been named the Rio, um, and the new features for both of these knees will be covered in the second part of this recording, including the Rio Knee XD. I'm now gonna discuss subitial socket design, specifically the NU Flex SIV method from Ryan Corbell and Stefania Fittoni. Um, they've actually developed a fantastic teachable technique for subitial sockets, of which the information is all available online for you to access. Um, Ryan's been fitting subitial sockets for over 10 years to over 125 amputees, and he's now publishing the results with Northwestern, as well as sharing his method and providing free training courses across the US. The main aim of the subitial socket is to provide comfort for the user without limiting their function. Um, so the trim lines for the socket typically sit 25 mil below the ischial tuberosity and 50 mil below the greater decanter. And this is achieved by global compression of the soft tissue to relieve pressure on the distal femur. The user will benefit from an increased range of motion as the socket wall no longer limits movement. It actually utilizes transtibial liners, which are then undersized between 10 and 30 percent, depending on the tissue consistency of the user. And the definitive socket will consist of a flexible inner proximally and a carbon outer featuring lower trim lines. A research has shown that elevated vacuum actually increases socket comfort with this design, although it's not imperative. And here's a comparison of Isha containment socket design versus the Northwestern solution method. With Isha containment socket, the proximal aspect of the socket includes Isha ramal containment, and the trim lines extend proximally to the ischial tuberosity, typically sitting high on the lateral side. So the idea of the IC socket is that they fit intimately with the ischial ramus and greater jacanta to lock onto the pelvis to create stability. And this style of socket does, however, reduce hip range of motion for the user. Um, whereas with the sub method, the trim lines will sit 25 mil below the tuberosity and do not impinge on the pelvis. So a combination of lower trim lines flexible socket construction and vacuum assisted suspension help improve comfort and function as well as improving range of motion at the hip for the user. But Tony and Colwell suggest that this method is best suited for experienced compliant amputees with residual limbs that are well healed and well regulated with volume. Um, Colwell has been fitting these kind of sockets for over 10 years so his experience is um, is quite vast and he's actually successfully fitted very complex limbs with open wounds, scarring, invaginations and skin grafts. And this suggests that this, this technique with experience can potentially have broader applications. Um, contraindications for use um, would be users with very short residual limbs of uh, under 12 centimeters or less. Um, in Chicago earlier this year, Brian discussed fitting someone with a nine centimeter long femur but as I said, he has been doing this method for a very long period of time. If the user has deep, long invaginations, these are also contraindication, as well as significant muscle bunching, where the user will lose contact between the residual limb and the liner, or if the user has issues with silicon liners as well. Transtibial liners are used to compress the limb, helping to generate a cylindrical shape, stiffening the soft tissues, to achieve stability of the socket with respect to the residual limb. 
heavily scarred or bulbous residual limbs can be addressed with a custom liner just to make sure that you get total contact for the user. But most limbs can be fitted with an off-the-shelf liner. And the transivial liners are preferred because they're non-tapered and uniform shape. Um, they help create a cylindrical profile and that helps to provide relatively high compression of the softer proximal tissues. And as mentioned earlier, it's recommended that we downsize between 10 and 30 percent. Um, and that just helps to ensure compression and total contact distally as well. Liners that have a fabric um, on the exterior surface are preferred um, just to help wick air from the liner and the socket to maintain suction. So there are three liners that are recommended for this technique. Um, Ryan recommends the relaxed 3C cushion for users with very soft tissue. The Synergy Cushion Liner in the middle there is recommended for users with firm tissue. And then the Sealant XTF can be utilized um, for sport applications and when using a sleeve is not preferred. So the Relax 3C Cushion is actually the stiffer silicon than the Synergy Liner. And it actually has a unique umbrella and textile cover to help with phantom pain relief as well. Um, this fabric has got shielding action against electromagnetic influences. Um, and that's been found to help reduce or abolish phantom limb pain and sensation. And this is the liner of choice for the Northwestern Subitial method for using the softer flabby tissue, as the stiffer silicone provides excellent soft tissue compression. The Transtibial Synergy Cushion Liner is also used for this technique and consists of a firm silicone outer layer, and that helps to provide soft tissue stability. And it also has a softer inner layer of silicone to provide cushioning. And this liner is actually very durable. It's got a nine-month warranty. Um, Caldwell and Fraterni recommend the Synergy Liner for users that have firm tissue. And then as mentioned, the Sealant XTF Liner, it does actually consist of a firmer silicon, which does help to provide good stability support to proximal tissues. And it's suited for users with long residual limbs. And you can utilize this with a seal ring, making this option sleeveless. And Caldwell is using this liner for passive as well as active vacuum for sport applications such as running and for instances where an outer sleeve is not wanted. To determine the seal ring size for the ceiling XTF, you need to first decide on the preferred placement of where you want the seal ring to sit. And we recommend placement at least 10 centimeters below the perineum. Take a circumferential measure directly over where the seal ring is expected to rest and then choose the closest ring size to the measurement. And if you have someone that's quite conical or fleshy, then you might want to downsize the ring one size. And then just make sure that you observe the tension of the ring, ensure the seal ring flattens out on the liner without deforming the limb shape. And seal ring kits are available um, for the seal and XTS just to help with it assessing ring sizing. So to determine tissue consistency in order to choose the appropriate liner, evaluate the user's residual limb with the patient sitting down. And then soft tissue can be classified if there's minimal shape change with contraction, and firm tissue is where there is a noticeable shape change with contraction. And with experience, I find that if someone has a mixture of firm and soft tissue, then I recommend the Relax 3C because it will help to contain that soft tissue. Um, whereas if they do have that firm tissue, then, then stick with the Synergy Liner. So the subitial casting method, have the user don the liner and roll it on as high into the residual limb as possible and get it as high as you can into the perineum. And then find that the proximal portion of the liner will then just sit at the gluteal fold and then deflect the liner up to 50 mil um, and that will help to increase soft tissue compression of the proximal soft tissues and actually helps to create the shape for casting as well. So you want to wrap the liner in cling film and then don a thin sock and then ensure that you mark your anterior midline. And this is crucially important as the cast ends up being very cylindrical and it may not be obvious where the correct rotation is. I also like to mark the adductor longus um, and take the measurements down from there. And I find that it helps to have this as a landmark as a reference. It means you can be consistent with where you take your measurements from. And this technique depends greatly on achieving the correct volume for the socket. So measuring three centimeter increments or 2.5 centimeter increments to ensure that you have enough information for your rectification. A snug ML measure is also recommended um, to be taken from the proximal edge of the liner at the perineal level, and then distally to the greater decanter, and just note how much compression can be achieved when pushing sub 
occur concurrently. The impression is taken with the patient sitting in a chair, um, so that the buttock of the amputated limb is at the edge of the seat and the residual limb is off the chair, flexed at 90 degrees and slightly abducted. And this allows gravity to pre-modify the limb shape. It creates a slight rectus relief, a generous medial flare, and a narrow ML due to the posterior soft tissue droop from gravity. Slight residual limb abduction also allows you to take the cast as proximal as you can and as close to the perineum as you can as possible. It's recommended to use casting tape um, as you're looking to capture a cylindrical shape with no manipulation of the soft tissue. And when you remove the mould, just take note of how easy or hard it is to remove, as this will influence your modification. And also take the time to assess if the residual limb is symmetrical or asymmetrical. Our limb shape is evaluated by viewing anteriorly and laterally to determine whether the lateral and posterior edges of the residual limb are parallel to midline of the long axis of the limb, or if they angle away from the midline of the long axis of the limb proximally. It's quite a complex description for classifying asymmetrical or symmetrical, and I'd advise you just to look at the residual limb from the anterior and the lateral side and consider if the shape looks similar or if one looks wider than the other. For instance, the example on the screen is of a symmetrical residual limb. However, an asymmetrical example would be if there was more tissue in the proximal posterior area like this, so that the lateral and anterior view no longer look the same. And if this was the case, then more material would need to be removed from the posterior element of the cast. Now this algorithm is actually freely available to view online and it will provide you with a guide to modification recommendations to be a positive model. And the really exciting thing about this technique is that if you accurately follow this procedure and the recipe, you will get results that are very close and very consistent. And just so by following the algorithm, you'll get recommendations as to what percentage reduction you need to do, depending on various factors. So for instance, if the user has soft tissue and the mold was easy to remove, then you would look to do a gradient reduction of 6% proximally down to 4%. And this is split up into thirds of the cast. So the proximal third, you will reduce by 6%, the middle third by 5%, and the distal third by 4%. And if the user is classified as symmetrical, then you'll be removing plaster equally from the lateral and posterior sides. And if it's asymmetrical, then you'll be removing plaster from either the lateral or posterior quadrants more um, in order to ensure that the mold looks cylindrical. And as mentioned, do stick to this algorithm. I've found it to be very accurate in providing very consistent results to people. And the goal of the rectification is to make the posterior and lateral edges nearer to parallel to the midline of the limb with the amount of plaster removed dependent on symmetrical or asymmetrical classification. So these diagrams show the relative amount of plaster removed posteriorly and laterally, based on whether the residual limb is considered symmetrical or asymmetrical. In the picture on the right, you can see the limb shape was classified as asymmetrical, with more plaster required to be removed from the posterior element. And with the positive model, you need to look to transfer an anterior reference mark and line of progression onto the model. Draw your ML reference points at right angles to the AP line, creating your quadrants, and then divide this again, which will help you determine where your rectification needs to be. Focus your percentage reductions purely in the proximal lateral area, flattening them into a boomerang shape that you can see here on the screen to your recommended percentage reduction. So you remove plaster proximally where the liner has been deflected, creating a return curve. And this will help provide additional soft tissue compression around the proximal 30 to 50 mil of the cast. And then blend these modifications in, creating a round barrel-like shape, smoothing the rest of the cast and removing any bumps. So th these photographs show the areas that have been modified in the positive model, focusing on the proximal, posterior and lateral quadrants. The proximal lateral modification extends down one third of the cast, whereas the posterior modification extends down two thirds of the cast. And really do ensure that your reductions are mainly made in these areas before you clean up your cast to your overall measures. And it is a really simple modification to make. And my advice is to make sure that you are accurate with your percentage reductions, and then you'll end up with a result that will be very close. And this is just showing you a definitive socket with the AP and the ML lines, and then your quadrants um, 
impose on top, and then this is where the modification occurs. So you have equal amounts of material removed from the posterior and the lateral side um, to create this quite cylindrical socket shape. So when assessing the check socket, assess the circumferential volume using socks, assess the proximal trim line. So you're looking for the trim line to sit 25 mil below the IT and 50 mil below the GT as well. And due to the way that you take the cast, the medial wall might end up being around 5 mil higher than the lateral trim, trim line. And it's important to keep this medial wall high for soft tissue support and to avoid an adductor roll. Deflect the liner over the proximal top of the socket using the ISOS knee sleeve to seal against it and obtain vacuum from the unity pump by having the user to take some steps. And then you just want to check for any lateral gapping. Um, the proximal tissue should feel firm and that will indicate that you've got an adequate amount of soft tissue compression. If they feel loose, it may be because you haven't quite achieved the correct volume and you may need to reduce your cast. And I just want to reiterate that if you take accurate measurements and ensure that you do reduce the cast accordingly to the algorithm, potentially you'll have nothing to adjust at check socket stage um, as the recipe just works very well. It's recommended doing a static fitting on a rigid check socket to assess volume utilizing a standing frame. Um, but I do prefer to do a dynamic fitting to assess volume fit and control. Um, if you do need to make any socket adjustments, Typically, there will be in the posterior or the lateral areas as gapping may be present. And it's recommended really not to trial a rigid socket any longer than the initial check fit because the rigid socket will not feel as comfortable as the definitive. Um, just because in the definitive socket, we'll be using a flexible inner, it'll have a bit more give and it will just feel that, that bit more comfortable. And when you are happy with your volume and the shape of the check socket, just go straight to the definitive. And as mentioned earlier, elevated vacuum isn't imperative, but it has been shown to increase socket comfort. Um, and that's in line with the experience that um, I've had over the, pre over the past year using this method. And when it comes to your definitive socket, you're actually utilizing the Flex CVA, which is now distributed by Otter, and then a carbon outer socket. And the benefit of this is that you can trim the carbon socket down to about a half or two thirds of the way down, um, allowing the proximal portion to be flexible and it means it's just going to be nice and comfortable in sitting, riding a bike, um, sitting on the toilet. Um, and the carbon socket can also be lower on the posterior side as well if required. So I'll just run through this video of John donning his prosthesis. Um, as there's no obvious landmarks for rotation, it can take a bit of practice to don. Um, however, surprisingly, the user will be out of feel if it's not orientated correctly, despite the cylindrical shape of the socket. And obviously the alignment will be out if it's not on correctly. Um, and you can see here he's just rolling the liner over the top of the socket and then he just seals it up with the ice frost knee sleeve. One of the benefits of having lower proximal trim lines is the increased range of motion um, that this could be users. And this is instantly noticed um, by the users in the, in the photographs here. Donning and doffing shoes and squatting was much easier um, without the socket trim lines impinging or restricting any range of motion. Um, toileting without removing the prosthesis is also um, a big thing that's been commented on, as well as being able to stretch the lower back and pick up objects from the floor as well. I'll just play some footage of users trialing their first official sockets with Unity Elevated Vacuum. And just observe the high level of control and the lack of lateral shift on all three subjects. All three subjects are using Unity Elevated Vacuum, but it is worth noting that the research states there was no difference in the level of stability when only using passive suction. However, the socket was reported to be more comfortable with active vacuum. And this is also in line um, with the experience that I've had, especially with these users when we tried both and they found that the elevated vacuum is more comfortable. To manufacture the definitive socket, the Flex EVA that Oster distributes is recommended. Um, it provides a comfortable, flexible inner socket with enough flexibility to be comfortable proximally, while providing adequate support for the proximal soft tissues. 
Um, the casting tape um, that's used for the method is also available from us. And I will also upload a PDF of a step-by-step -step manufacturing guide to the Silvicial socket design with ISOC 544 um, to the website that you can refer back to as well. I'm now going to hand you over to Cathy, who's going to run through training techniques. Thanks, Sarah. The first thing to note is that the lower trim lines of the sub-issue or socket are going to indicate a need for training to optimise the functioning of the glute med to prevent lateral trunk bending. There will also need to be more attention to the hip extensors on stair ascent. If we look at the diagram on the left, we see the ischial containment socket locking in the pelvis there and giving the gluteus medius muscle a big hand in controlling the lateral pelvic shift of the pelvis. Whereas in the right hand side, we can see the subischial socket where the muscle is going to have to do a lot more work to control lateral pelvic shift um, of the pelvis during mid stance on the prosthesis. Just to demonstrate this, I'm going to get you to do a little exercise in your room and I'm assuming no one's watching you so you won't mind doing it. So if you stand up, place your hands on your iliac crest and try to stand on your left leg but don't allow your pelvis to move to the left. What you should be noticing is that it's very difficult to achieve standing on the left leg if the pelvis doesn't move left over the leg. So how are you going to do that? The answer is bilateral trunk bending. And we can see in the diagram here where the pelvis has not shifted over the stance foot on the right hand side of the model. The shoulders have done the work instead and the trunk has laterally bended. The shoulders have, lift, have translated over the foot and the pelvis has not. And this is probably one of the most common gait deviations for amputee gait. In normal gait, the pelvis tracks laterally towards the weight-bearing side and it, it shifts to its maximum just after mid-stance. So in walking forwards, we have a nice sinusoidal wave being drawn by the pelvis. Control of this sinusoidal wave towards the stance side is via the eccentric contraction of the gluteus medius muscle, rotation of the upper body in opposition to the pelvis, and core stability in maintaining an erect trunk. There's decrease in effectiveness of the gluteus medius muscle after amputation, purely because of the destabilization of the lever's contact with the ground. Obviously, the skeleton is no longer linking the muscle to the ground, so that the action will be confounded by the interface between the stump and the socket and this artificial joint that is created. There may also be weakness of the glute med muscle uh, because the muscle has not been used in this fashion um, after the amputation and so they haven't been walking obviously for about at least three weeks. And there's decreased core and abdominal strength due to the decrease in weight on the affected side. So what we see effectively is a muscle imbalance of the abdominals of the amputee due to the amputation itself. The effectiveness of the gluteus medius is also influenced by sectioning of the antagonists or the AD ductors. And once that happens, the AD ductors being cut will contract less effectively and you may get an, a bias towards the glute medius and the formation of an abduction contracture. The abductors, of course, are remaining intact and may become shortened and overactive in this case. And therefore, there will be difficulty in achieving the lengthened and adducted position that the gluteus medius requires to function optimally during the stance phase of gait. So if we just summarise that, looking at the action of the abductors in stance phase, for them to be maximally effective, they need to be lengthened by adduction of the femoral remnant. They need to be working eccentrically, which means that they are lengthening while contracting, and they need to be unimpeded by pain. Associated loss of the upper body rotation in opposition to the lower body will also increase that lateral trunk bending effect. If you cast your mind back to the diagram of the 
figure laterally trunk bending, you will have noticed that there was no rotation of the shoulders and the shoulders just moved down laterally on the stance side. Whereas normally during gait, our shoulders rotate in opposition to the pelvis during walking. This can be lost in the amputee's gait and needs to be reinstated during the gait training process. So if we look here at someone going straight onto a stubby shield socket, you can see straight away the lateral trunk bending that is happening during stance phase on the prosthesis and the lack of rotation that occurs. On the right hand side, notice with the equal arm swing and the rotation of the shoulders in opposition to the lower limbs means that the amputee is balanced more effectively on the prosthesis. Also notice on the left hand side, the pelvis does not translate laterally. And on the right hand side, every time he steps on the prosthesis, the, prosthesis, the pelvis does in fact move laterally. So it moves over the foot. So I've just done a still here for you in both of those gait patterns and this uh, pointed out for you a little more. You can see on the left hand side, although the shoulders and the pelvis are both um, parallel, on the left hand side, the shoulders have translated laterally. And so the balance and the weight of the amputee is falling way, way outside of his base of support. Whereas on the left hand side, the shoulders and the pelvis again are parallel but they're more in line in a perpendicular line with each other and the weight of the amputee falls much closer to the foot so he feels much more balanced over the prosthesis. And that is because there is an increase in activity in the gluteus medius combined with the rotation of the upper body balancing the weight over the prosthesis. So if we look at strategies for increasing weight bearing and lateral pelvic shift onto the prosthesis, we can do things like using body weight scales and biofeedback so that the patient can see exactly how much weight they're putting on the prosthesis and whether they're transferring their weight effectively to that side. We can do weight transference exercises with mirror feedback so the patient can see the pelvis moving to the prosthetic side and they can also note the alignment that's required to get over the prosthetic foot. And we can decrease uh, the contralateral hand support by putting the weight down through the ipsilateral hand. We increase the lateral pelvic shift to the prosthetic side. And we can also add resistance to the activity, as you can see in the photo here, with the TheraBand around the pelvis. And he has to pull across towards the prosthetic side. And when you ask the patient, they will be able to feel an increase in pressure down through the prosthesis and increase in weight bearing effectively through the prosthesis. Resisted lateral pelvic shift exercises, very effective in increasing lateral pelvic shift. You can see in the, in the picture on the left, um, stepping up onto the step sideways, without resistance, there hasn't been any lateral pelvic shift to the prosthetic side. But when a TheraBand is placed around the pelvis, as in the diagram on the right, you can see that the pelvis has shifted against that resistance over the prosthesis for him to be able to elevate the non-affected foot and step up onto the step. To increase your abductor functioning, we can look at strengthening throughout the range. So abducting and then controlling the AD duction of the leg back towards the midline. And in the diagram on the right, you can see that we have reversed the TheraBand so that stability is being uh, targeted here in this exercise and is abducting and adducting the sound limb against resistance. So firstly, we're looking at uh, strengthening and on the right-hand side, we're looking at the stability function of the muscle. Also note that I've used the bar on the same side as the prosthesis on the right hand side to increase weight bearing and lateral shift towards the prosthesis. By resisting uh, the activity, 
Yudhika et al. in 2002 demonstrated that this form of gait training leads to increased weight bearing on the prosthesis, an increase in the general stride length. However, there is a decreased step length on the amputated side, which is often vastly increased in amputee gait. But there is an increase in step length of the sound side, and traditionally that is always decreased in amputee gait. So we're reversing those undesirable gait deviations and increasing a more optimised gait, which is looking at equalising the step length by decreasing prosthetic step length, increasing sound limb step length, and you will also notice that there will be an increase in self-selected speed. Thank you, Cathy. Um, I'll now run through an overview of ProFlex mechanics and the medical benefits, as well as an overview of the ProFlex family and the new additions of the ProFlex XT torsion and ProFlex LV torsion. So the ProFlex foot was compared to the Veriflex foot in the study, and it was found to have an increased ankle range of motion of 82%. It was also found to have an increased ankle power of 93%, which results in an increased push-off at terminal stance, Except that this push-off happens a bit later, extending the stance phase side periods of support, and meaning that the body's centre of pressure is less elevated when stepping onto the sound side. So a combination of these features means that there's an overall medical benefit of reducing the impact on the sound side by 11%, as well as reducing the virus moment on the sound side by 15%. So the ProFlex consists of three carbon fibre blades with new pivot technology. It features polycentric ankle geometry, and the blades interact to control stiffness and the rate of plantar flexion and dorsal flexion. So there's a low stiffness, so a high flexibility in the mid-range, which gives the greater range of motion of 27 degrees in total. And then there's a high stiffness in terminal stance to pre-swing, which assists in proportion, creating a powerful push-off that is almost twice that as a very flex foot. And the ProFlex is delivering the increased range of motion, a powerful push-off, and a physiological center of pressure movement without hydraulics or microprocessor technology. And interestingly enough, um, it's delivering a powerful push-off that's only 12% less than a bion foot, which uses a battery-powered actuator to actually generate power. I just to run through this video again, just to show that the features of the ProFlex actually allow it to store energy in early stance, release energy into mid-stance and progressively stiffen the foot to provide a stronger push-off moment in late stance. And the heel and the toe are actually staying on the ground for a, a longer period of time. I'll just take you through how the ProFlex achieves this. Um, so at loading response, you get active compression of the heel blade and the upper blade. But then we actually get this backwards rotation occurring around the main pivot axis. The back link transfers load onto the middle blade, and this deflects downwards, creating 10 degrees of real plant flexion occurring instantly at loading response. During mid stance, we get rotation through the main pivot axis, which keeps the heel and the toe on the ground for longer, maintaining the full length toe lever for maximum mechanical advantage. And when we get to terminal stance, the sole blade and the upper blade compress and store energy. And then in addition, we get this anterior rotation occurring around the pivot axis. The back link pulls the mid lever upwards, it deflects up, and it actually creates 17 degrees of real dorsal flexion in terminal stance. At push off, we get energy return from the compressed sole blade and the compressed upper blade. The mid lever creates an active plant flexion moment, and the main pivot axis undergoes a backward plant flexion torque moment. And we get this mechanically powered push off that, as I mentioned, is actually 93% more than the Veriflex and only 12% less than what you get with the Biome. You can see in this video here that the ProFlex will adapt instantly to stairs. And you can see in this video that Joni is descending the stairs step over step, putting a whole foot on the step and allowing her to stand in a more natural manner due to that mid-range compliance. And that's just going to help to reduce stress on joints and allow her to walk more naturally down the stairs. The range of motion in the foot can be really seen on slopes, um, where the lower stiffness and early stance helps to reduce socket pressure on the residual limb, 
during slope ascent and slope descent. The stiffness curves for the Variflex and the Proflex compared, and you can see here on the graph that there is a low stiffness around mid stance and a high stiffness that is created in later stance in comparison to the Variflex. And the high energy return along with the progressive stiffening that occurs is similar to what is seen in an anatomical ankle, and it's an indication of a powerful push off during late stance. The study by Strife et al. showed that osteoarthritis in the sound side knee joint is 17 times higher in traumatic transtibial amputees than in age matched non amputees, and that also pain is twice as common. And this actually results from an asymmetrical gait increased impact and more time spent on the sound side. And the process is tackling the principal mechanical causes of osteoarthritis by helping to enhance gait symmetry, by improving progression of the center of pressure, reducing sound side loading by reducing peak impact by 11%, and reducing the knee virus moment by 15%. And the powerful push-off means that the body's center of pressure is less elevated on the prosthetic side at the time of stepping forward onto the sound side. And this results in a smoother and more symmetrical gait with reduced impact on the sound side. So the Proflex is aimed at all lower limb amputees who fit into the K2, K3 category. Um, users that do recreational activities such as hiking or they need to negotiate uneven ground, stairs and ramps will really benefit from the mid-range compliance and instant adaptability to uneven ground and that the powerful push-off that this foot provides also. It's not intended for high impact use. Um, users that are in the K3 and K4 range might want to consider the Proflex XD. Um, but for most users, activities of daily living, and as I've mentioned, activities such as hiking, um, the Proflex will provide an excellent level of compliance and comfort for the user. The Proflex XD is ideal for K3 and K4 clients. Um, it makes a great crossover foot for everyday activities, including jogging and sports, as well as their everyday walking limb. Um, it provides 10 mil of compression from its T-shaped design. It's got an improved rollover when you compare it to the previous Veriflex XC, um, and it's also got increased function and satisfaction when you compare it to the Veriflex and the Veriflex XC. It's recommended for clients up to 166 kgs that engage in moderate to high impact level activities on a regular basis, such as basketball or jogging, as well as daily walking activities as well. We've just launched the Proflex XC Torsion, which replaces the Veriflex XC Rotate which unfortunately has had some durability problems. So the torsion cell has been redesigned to ensure that the materials are completely compatible. The surface area of the rod has been increased and the null surface pattern which holds the torsion cell in place is more rough to prevent slip. And this foot is ideal for active users who benefit from the increased shock and torsion for comfort and reduce stress on the residual limb. And it's also unity compatible, which the previous XC Rotate was not. And just to show you the comparison test that was done on the XC torsion versus the Veriflex XC rotate, you can see from this graph that before the Veriflex rotate meets 1 million cycles, play is already developed and keeps on going, as you can see from the black line. Whereas the XC torsion plateaus out at a million cycles and continues to be robust beyond that. So just to give you a recap on the Proflex LP, the Proflex LP offers a greater range of ankle motion than other feet with low build heights, um, for instance, the LP Veriflex. It's providing an improved physiological gait and increased function and satisfaction for users. It's actually recommended for clients up to 166 kgs, uh, for users with longer residual limbs where clearance can be an issue, and also moderate to high impact levels also. So the middle blade has been reversed tapered, which allows more flex anteriorly. So the posterior part of the blade is thinner and it actually gets gradually thicker anteriorly towards the sole blade attachment points. The functional ankle joint center of the Proflex LP is also closer to anatomical than the LP Veriflex. And effectively, what we're going to get is a very flexible foot in mid stance with build up of progressive stiffness towards terminal stance, giving it a powerful push off. So during level ground walking, you can see here that the heel and the toe are going to stay on the ground for longer because we've got this lower stiffness in early stance. As it roll over, we've got a good range of mid-range compliance. And then that rocker blade is going to contact the middle blade 
build up stiffness to give us the push off. And if we compare the LP Bariflex on the left, comparison to the Proflex LP on the right, you can see the improved range of motion that you get and the amount of time that the heel and toe are going to stay on the ground, especially that improved dorsiflexion range. The interesting thing about the Proflex LP is that it follows a very similar stiffness curve to the Proflex. Um, so you can see the Proflex here with the yellow line and the Proflex LP with the black line. We've got a very similar low stiffness in early stance with the stiffness building up at the same time as the Proflex. Um, and this low resistance in initial dorsal flexion means that there's less moment needed from the residual limb to load the foot. And then the higher displacement for the Proflex LP when you compare it to the Veriflex LP indicates that there's a greater range of motion with the same load applied to the foot. And interestingly enough, we found that the Proflex LP almost had equal satisfaction to a Veriflex and obviously um, a higher satisfaction level to the LP Veriflex. Um, so to get that from a low profile foot is actually very impressive. Um, and the user comments are that they feel like they're getting a lot of energy in the toe, that it's very smooth and it's got a natural rollover feel as well. And now we've introduced the Proflex LP torsion as well. So for users that would benefit again from that extra shock and that torsion element to reduce stress on the socket, um, may benefit from the LP torsion if they can fit that into the build height. Um, they're going to get the benefit of the range of motion um, with the heel and toe staying on the ground for longer um, from the foot, as well as the shock and torsion element to it as well. So thank you for listening to this recording. The second half of the session is going to be recorded separately, and it will also be put on the website to view. And that will cover new features of the Rio Knee, training recommendations in order to get the best out of the rear knee, as well as coverage of the awesome mechanical knee range alongside physio training techniques. Thank you very much.